All right, so low latency lock free utilities. What is low latency? Low latency is nanoseconds. Every CPU cycle matters. You want to fit everything on level 3 cache. You want to pin thread to CPU cores. Do you know what pinning is? It's setting affinity. On Windows, it's called affinity. So you can do that uh, by going task manager, right clicking on the process, and then there is set affinity, and you can choose which CPU cores this uh, process can run on. You can do the same thing uh, for threads um, in your program by using the OS API. You can actually pin given thread to given CPU core. So what that means is operating system will not allow this thread to run on different CPU core. This is important because you know your, your CPU core is running some, some code of some thread and it would be very like not good for performance if it continued on some other core, right? If, if system preempted this thread or something. So one thing is that we're doing lock free, wait free, so that we don't get into operating system. We don't interrupt the thread. Thread keeps going. It keeps going at full throttle, full RPM. It just keeps going and that's it. There is no blocks, no stops. It just needs to go. It needs to burn CPU. CPU needs to be hot 100%. And that's what it is. The CPU core must be 100%. If it is not 100%, then you're doing something wrong. This is what log-free programming is. You want log-free and wait-free programming so that your threads are run in full throttle without any interruption. That's what I just said. Now, you can watch those two videos if you like. I recommend that you watch the last uh, chapters there in, in Ring Buffer 2 because they're important. I explain about level 3 cache and stuff. And ring both of us. Um, yeah, so please please watch those videos. Uh, low latency ring buffer. So I put some notes here so you can read about that a little bit. And I put more of those notes with those exclamations, something that you may not notice. So I put it as important. So first thing first, this is C. So because this is C, uh, you are responsible for allocating everything, whether it is a ring buffer or whether it is a shared pointer. I can show you here. There is a menu actually here on GitHub recently, so you can go to log free atomic shared pointer and you will see that I'm stating the same thing about, um, you know, allocations. You are responsible for deallocating and you are responsible for allocating memory. And in case of shared pointer, because this is C, I cannot use templates and also because I would like it to be flexible so that it can be done, used in kernel mode and user mode and with different type of memory allocators, maybe free lists. Um, you know, you have to implement your destroy and your new, right? You have to implement it. This allocate memory needs to be something that gives memory and this deallocate memory needs to be something that returns it to the pool, right? Then this destroy food data is just your function to deinitialize this uh, type of yours. So, you know, it's a good idea to have a separate function to, for that, not make it here, right? And uh, same here, you have um, create new foo. So that's again, it would be a good idea if you have your own new function and not put code here. Um, so that's that's a, that's a shared pointer. Now the um, storing and loading of atomic shared pointers. So there is notes here and I say like this, they are symmetrical, so they have same notes. Uh, NT arc, so the shared pointer, uh, shall be used within the scope of the function. So what does it mean? We have the NT arc defined here. It's like smart pointer, or shared pointer in C++, right? So what do you do? You just declare it in the scope and it leaves in the scope. So this is the scope, this is the scope, this is the function, right? And this thing should leave from here until here this is its lifetime the lifetime is like this this is the lifetime of that thing and this lifetime should not escape anywhere you should never ever move this anywhere else right it should just stay in this function now if you need to call a function that takes the anti arc you should pass this as reference right you should use the p anti arc type which is defined as pointer to anti arc because this is c but we say pass as reference. And actually this is the case of such function that takes it as reference. Uh, so we have local NT arc in, defined in this function and we're passing it as reference here to this, to this atomic star, right? Now, second note to notice is that um, if, you, if you wanna save this NT arc anywhere, 
you must use atomic store you shall never ever copy it in any other form or shape you should never use clone you should always use atomic star why because this is thread safe atomic star is one and only way you are allowed to copy one arc that is in your local scope into shared scope into shared scope you can assume that every data structure every data structure is a shared scope why even if it is a private field if that data structure is a private member of a class or something well class here in c we have all structs but say it, it's private it's it's only within the module or something nothing else accesses it but how many threads are accessing it uh, or do you only have single thread in there if you have single thread then okay perhaps you can use clone but in, mo in most cases when you have a shared data structure very often it is used by multiple threads right and it might not be obvious the use of multi by multiple threads might be um you know hidden from you right because maybe maybe the threads are managed outside of your code somewhere else and you know your your, your piece of code is being called and uh, from some functions that is running on a different thread and you know it, it, it's 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 going to be a situation so if you use atomic store you are not sacrificing any time because atomic store is literally swapping few integers it's thread safe there is no locks there is no weights and you know the, the chances that there is a collision and there has to be a retry are very low so you know this is just a few swaps of few integers this is this is literally nothing you should always use atomic store to to save the pointer into into the structure that's a safe way of doing it and then um you know you need to drop this this local arc at the end so the way this is designed is that you declare your ntr this is c again so you declare your nt arc in your scope of your of your function and it leaves until the end of the scope and if you don't do drop at the end it will be memoric you know because this this arc here when you create it here right this full new is, is we, we we did that function before so it is your function it is a constructor that we we allocated this thing so that's example of of allocating the new one and we store that new one into this shared gfu but then we need to we need to drop it right we need to drop it because you know this um this foo will be created with one reference store always will add one more reference store will never steal reference from you okay so so you always end up with that one reference which you had in the beginning so before this store you have one reference after after calling for new you do have one reference and you have to release that one reference at the end this store doesn't change the fact that you had one reference but before store you had one reference and after store you still have one reference right well the the, the object itself have, may, may have multiple references but you your function this scope does have one reference so we can assume one NT arc for one NT arc is one reference. This NT arc is one reference and it has to be released. And the same apply to load. Uh, one NT arc, one load loads the value from the shared variable into this arc, right? And when it is loaded, you have to drop it, right? You, you're receiving one, one reference. You have this one reference for yourself, right? the way this works it's 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 using some philosophy as well because without philosophy things just don't work right so the way this drop works it will drop the last reference and it is thread safe not because there is any guards protecting this safety but because if it is last reference if you follow this pattern then this will be the last thread using it and there is no guards needed if you're releasing the last reference to an object then current thread is the last thread that has any access, any visibility of this object. And this is why it's safe because no other thread can see this object. No other, no other thread can, can use this object for anything. That's why it is so important to use those atomic loads, atomic store, because they will increase number of references. Every shared variable is one extra reference. So this GFU here is one reference more than this current scope. This scope is one reference, but this shared variable here is one more. So you know once we load this now we have two references and we need to release and we have one but if we load and at the same time some other thread comes in and does the store you know we still have that one reference right the load will give us this one reference 
and this might have been you know replaced with the new now new 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 uh, new foo so so this star here might be replacing with the new foo so we, we drop one reference but we drop one reference but we don't kill the object yet because this this thread here that's doing this still has one reference and this thread will be done in that in that case it will be the last thread seeing this object and this drop will actually delete this object right because this is the last uh, thread seeing it the philosophy of being the last thread who can potentially see the object uh, is important here right so because of that there is no guards required and it's it's safe now with regards to ring buffers so we can scroll up there is a section about ring buffers as well so there is a um, low latency ring buffer here this section so what about ring buffer? So ring buffer is two structures, ring B and ring B pause. The ring B is a shared structure which you share between threads. And this is essentially a special data structure that controls the transactions of read and write into this buffer. So you are the owner of the buffer. You allocated the memory in whichever way you want. And you know how you allocated it, what addresses you aligned, and if you guaranteed whether this is loaded into cache or not, you know, you should do all these things. But uh, this structure, what it controls is you, uh, the transactions. So in order to write or read from this buffer that you allocated, this structure will tell you which index you should be reading or writing to, right? And, and, you know, this structure is just a structure, but there's functions that do that, right? So you begin transaction and this will tell you the index. If, it's, if it is a read transaction, this will be the index for you to read. If it's a write transaction, it will be an index for you to write. So this is what this is. The empty ring pause is a transaction, okay? It's a local state that you store in your function that is either producer or consumer. And you use this empty ring pause to store state of the transaction. It is a reusable local variable. So you will see that I'm using one entering post for the whole function that has a loop inside, but it, 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 it's not really a big deal, right? You can reuse it. You can reuse for each iteration, but uh, yeah, it, it represents a, a transaction. So it, uh, when, you uh, when you begin, you will get this set to some something inside, and then when you commit, this will be used then to commit, you know? Um, Next, uh, we have multiple producers, multiple consumers. So how can we possibly have multiple producers, multiple consumers? While well, this ring buffer is so simple. So this entering B is a really simple control structure. It has just four integers in it, plus size fifth, but four main integers that are actually changing the values. How can you achieve um, multiple producers and multi consumers with four integers? Well, I guess I invented it. So, you know, it's possible, right? Now, there is also a limitation. So the, the way I'm, I'm supporting this multi-producers, multi-consumers requires that the size of a buffer is bigger than total number of consumers and producers. So if you have, say, two producers and four consumers, the total number is six. So the buffer size must be bigger than that. And ideally, it should be at least twice as big you know, twice as big to give some space for those producers. And I would even I would even go bigger than twice, right? Because, you know, this, this is all dynamic system and those producers and consumers aren't static. They keep reading and writing and some producers will be faster, some will be slower and so on. And it's kind of synchronized as well because, uh, you know, the way this, this works is uh, pro producers cannot proceed with committing the transactions until the first producer commits so there is this sequencing of producing but they are by no chances uh, serialized that is just a barrier so they can do work in parallel and then when they commit that is commits are serialized right uh, and and yeah and the, for for reading as well reads uh, commits for the reads are serialized a bigger buffer is more resistant to jitter. It allows more producers and consumers while latency is not affected. Because of how it works, the control structure is in no way affected by the ring buffer size. So it really doesn't matter how big is the ring buffer because changing those integers that are in this control structure takes the same amount of time no matter the size of the ring buffer. 
So the latencies that do matter, they, they, they are not affected. So what latencies actually do matter? So time it takes, right? Time it takes for you to put an item into your ring buffer to receive it on the other thread. So what's the time? So we measure the time from the moment when, you know, you inserted your data to the moment when you could pick it up on the on the other thread. And, and you can actually think of it as time from commit, from commit to a begin, right? So, so we're not measuring the full begin to commit. So on the producer side, you have begin write data commit. And on the consumer side, you have begin read commit. So from time from the begin of write to uh, commit of the read. So that's that so you could measure that. But this is not interesting. Like you can measure that as your latency, but the, the latency of the ring buffer is the latency of how much time it takes from the commit of the write to the begin of the read, because this is the time it takes for data to travel from one thread to another thread. This is the actual time needed for data to travel between threads, okay? Between between CPU cores in some form or shape. So that, that commit that we're doing there, this is the way for the other thread to, to, you know, to know that you can actually start reading, right, this data. So that's one latency. Another latency is how much time it takes to begin the transaction. So if I just wrote data into the buffer without any begin transaction, just like this, if I just wrote data, what's the difference? How much, how much uh, latency does it introduce to call begin? How much latency the, the call itself when there is no contention whatsoever? So begin is immediate, is immediate. Okay, you can enter, no wait. How much time it takes? So in the case of this ring buffer, it should be zero nanoseconds, right? Or 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 few nanoseconds, like depending how fast is your CPU in swapping integers. Uh, the third latency is gonna how much time it takes to wake up. And I don't mean the time that uh, you actually was waiting in the spin, because there will be a spin. If, 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 you, if you can write to a ring buffer, then you have to spin until you can. So well, that, that's not that's necessary, right? You, 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 what else would you be doing? If the ring buffer is full, you cannot be writing, or ring buffer is empty, you cannot be reading. So you have to be spinning. So the time it takes, not from the beginning when you started you know, this weight spinning, but uh, it's time from when you finished weight spinning. So the time from the moment when um, you know you should have wake up, right? The data, the, the the state of the ring, the time between the state of the ring buffer changed to the state that you would you can wake up to the time when you actually woke up, right? So 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 again, it is the the the, the signaling time between the two CPU cores, between one thread and another thread. So. There was a condition that the buffer was empty and you were spinning on the consumer and the producer finally produced an item and from the moment it produced that item to the moment you wake up, that's the time uh, you we're measuring, right? So that's the third latency. Now, this is log free weight free solution, meaning that all operations on the ring buffer and ring buffer position are never acquiring any logs from operating system and are never waiting for operating system. So that means that, um, you know, we, we don't get any context switches. We don't get any uh, rescheduling by op uh, operating systems of our, of our thread, right? Of our threads. Our threads are not getting interrupted by operating system. Uh, our threads are just running at full throttle, as we said in the beginning. And, you know, it just, it just either spins waiting until the other thread puts something on read something from the buffer or it keeps reading. And if there is a, um, the ideal situation is if there is two threads using this ring buffer and the producer is producing at average speed, the same average speed as the consumer is consuming. So the average speed between the two threads should be the same, right? So if producer produces some number of items per microsecond, say it produces three items per microsecond, then consumer needs to have a speed of three items per microsecond, you know, on average. If, if, if like, the, if it deviates, that's okay. 
and then you you know you compensate with the size of ring buffer of course if you have like if you will have latencies right your, your consumer or producer like we, we, it's not up to me how slow is your consumer um, but but the, the latency between transferring of a message between two cores whether it is the data or whether it is signal to continue reading or writing and that that is the latency that I, I, I want you to have the lowest right um, well, buffer um, in order to be thread safe must implement weight semantics of course we cannot be writing over over the the elements that were not read yet right if if reading thread didn't read all the items yet and you're trying to overwrite the items well that should not be allowed so so writing thread needs to wait uh, reading thread should not be reading same items again before you know read, writer has a chance to write new data so you know we, we should definitely spin weight if if we reach the moment where, where there is no more data or where is too much data, right? Um, but we never yield to operating system, which is what I said, uh, meaning that the CPU core is fully consumed in this weight and guarantees instant wake up. Spinning guarantees for instant wake up because I use memory barriers. There is no yielding to operating system and uh, memory barriers are essential in the instant. Without memory barriers, the, the wake up would not be instant because uh, cache coherency in CPU is, well, not not necessarily always does the job. So you may do a few spin iterations before it actually gets the new value. Uh, so memory barriers are essential. This solution is designed for pipelining. Okay, so what is pipelining? Pipelining is essentially you split the work that is to be done into chunks and uh, you do one, first like the first and the second like if you two if you split into two chunks every 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 job you split, split split into two chunks then you do the first chunk on the one core and you do the second chunk on second core so if you have first job and second job then say the first job was already pro is is now at the stage that the second chunk of the first job is processed by the second core so second chunk of the, of the first job on the second core and first chunk of the second job on the first core so so the average time of processing will be you know half half like uh, you know half of the time right because uh, obviously we 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 we, we have like instead of having this and the, like if you serialize you have like one job and after that is another job so in order for for this second job to start the whole, the time required is the the time required for processing the first job but if you if you pipeline it then in order to start work on the second job you only need a half time right so it's it's half it's it's much better uh, like you improve the bandwidth and you know you improve reliability if you, if you for example read network packets and the reading thread, so the producer, the reading thread is the producer because it's reading from the adapter, but it's writing into ring buffer. So if that is, um, you know, constantly reading at constant rate, you know, then the ring buffer will play the role of, you know, uh, removing the jitter, right? So so because because you may want to have very, maybe, maybe in the reading from your network adapter is very fragile and you need to, you know, read it at constant intervals. Whereas processing of the data can be slow and fast and you don't control it. So, you know, it's better when the other core is doing that. So maybe that's why you want to use ring buffer, right? Um, this solution works well for situation when either data keeps coming from source or sync keeps sending data. So this is what I said. So uh, when I say sync keeps sending data, uh, well, data keeps coming from the source I already said. So let's say there is some network adapters that keeps, you need to keep pull from it in, in regular intervals because otherwise, you know, you, you, something will go wrong. Um, things, things keep sending data. Maybe this is the same situation the other way. So maybe, you know, you need to keep pulling the, the ring buffer for, for new data to send it to the, to the adapter because you have some constant rate at which you need to be sending to the adapter, right? And the essential indicator whether this solution is good for you is whether you have lots of data that keeps moving. So whether you keep receiving something or sending something, but if there is this constant interval or almost constant interval, you have some time constraints on, on either side, 
you know, then, then you may want to use this ring buffer because um, then you have like a very good real time uh, capability of it, right? So you can, you know, you won't be dropping packets or something like this or, or dropping the windows for sending or something like this, you know. Um, yeah, if 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 your uh, if your data is moving, but if it is not really suitable for cases when you have lots of waiting on I/O, so this isn't solution for the case when you're just you know reading a file from the hard drive and then doing some processing. This isn't like for that use just some normal queue, <laughs> you know, use some normal queue, use use uh, co conditional variable, right? Um, don't use this solution for this kind of work because this isn't solution for this type of work, right? Solution might be viable for when there is number of source channels or things that you can scan. And in such cases, you can use asynchronous polling. So we do support polling, which is asynchronous. So this means instead of spinning, like uh, the non-asynchronous will just spin when there is like ring buffer and the, 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 re the write, for example, reach the end and uh, the, the reader needs to continue and release some, some slots, right? So we're spinning. Um, but, but we can, for example, say, okay, but, uh, you know, if the operation would block and there is another ring buffer I could pull from, right? Then I'd rather go to the other ring buffer. So imagine that, you know, you, you don't have one ring buffer, but imagine that you have 20 ring buffers or maybe 100 ring buffers, right? And, uh, you know, and maybe you just walk all around them in round-robin fashion and you keep pulling from each of them. And if you get data, you get data. If you don't get data, you go to the next one. And, you know, this way you're still burning CPU, but at least you're doing some work in this CPU, right? You're at least, you know, scanning through, through different uh, inputs or outputs. And this is actually how some of the low latency, you know, routers work. They just scan their ports and if there is data packet on the port or not. So... This is what they do. Um, normally, asynchronous programming may sound like opposite to low latency. So yes and no. As I said, some of the low latency routers do round robin on the ports, uh, for example. So yeah. So, so that's that's you know that's that's how it works. Um, but yeah, uh, this this is gonna be rather low latency to pull through multiple ring buffers because again there is no waiting. Of course, it will be a little bit slower. Uh, will take time to, if you pull just one ring buffer instead of pulling like to four on 10, it, it's faster to pull one, right? But may, maybe you don't need this extra speed. Maybe, maybe you know, maybe, maybe, maybe you, you, you need to measure what is the latency, right? If pulling 10 ring buffers maybe takes X nanoseconds and your processing takes you know this amount right so it's the, the magnitude is completely different so you know you may think twice before you say ah oh, it's a bad idea um yeah so so that that's that's what it says here all right so this is this is more or less what i wanted to tell you about this log free solution so that you are more aware of um when they are useful when they're not very useful and what are the rules to adhere to so treat this as guidance as as you know so that if you want to use those ring buffers maybe for drivers could be good for some something i don't know what exactly because again the, you don't want drivers to eat all cpu right so <laughs> so so may, maybe need to be used wisely um with with regards to you know lock free shared pointer there are some rules you really need to follow. And if you follow these rules, you'll be in the very safe, nice world. It's very fast structure. It's using, you know, atomic operations. All these operations are nothing else than just swap some integers and increment some integers. So it is really fast. Um, so yeah, there is no reason for you to not use that, night, right? So those loads and those stores. All right. Um, so I guess this is what I had to say about this low latency lock free utilities. Um, I wonder what kind of solutions you will create with them. If you do any benchmarks, you can tell me what you what the, what information you got from those benchmarks. These are the uh, maybe latencies you want to measure. And uh, yeah, see you soon with another video maybe about some other stuff.
Thank you for watching.